Do you know the reason they call this the sanctuary is because it's set aside, it's sanctified from the world. And when we walk in, I, I'm going I'm to hurt some religious folks today, but it's okay. When we walk in, we're on holy ground. In the first church, when you came in, you were greeted with a kiss. And before you walked into the what we call sanctuary today, which for them it was temple, you came in barefooted. So some of y'all that send us messages about these folks up here on the platform barefooted, it is scriptural. Just saying. Just saying. Please keep yours on, Curry. <laughs> Hallelujah. Miss <laughs> Angela, come here a minute. Just got some announcements to make for you. Because if I do it, I'm going to mess it all up. Because I, I mean, I've got a whole bunch. Um, Operation Christmas Child, next Sunday is the last Sunday for collecting. We're a long way from our 100 boxes. Um, we'll take donations. If you don't want to shop, you can bring your box in. Um, we need washcloths, toothbrushes, and soap for sure, and some older boys' wow items, the 10 to 14 age. That's a hard age to buy for. So if you want to dote, Donate for shopping. I need it today or Wednesday. And next, next Sunday is the last day for donations. And the following Wednesday, we're going to, our Wednesday evening service will be packing. After praise and worship. We don't ever miss praise and worship. And, and, you know, I, I get that all the time. Are we going to have praise and worship? We're showing up, ain't we? We go out. The preacher might get silenced and sit down, but we go worship because we are a worshiping church because we know a truth. The truth is when you send up praise, he sends his presence down. Every time. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in the house of God without his presence. And the church said, Amen. 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 And amen. Whew. We're in part four on a series of be anxious for nothing. If you will turn with me to Philippians chapter four, and I'll give you a little backstory for those that are just joining us and, and those that are watching by live stream. Uh, Paul had a dream of going to Rome to become a preacher and found himself as a preacher, a prisoner. I don't know about most of you, maybe somewhere in life, you, you, you dreamed of being one thing but found yourself in another place. And at the end of the day, Paul was imprisoned for preaching the gospel. And he's shackled to a, a guard 24-7. Of all people that had any right to be anxious or concerned or worried, because he's sitting there in that prison cell not knowing what his destiny was. Because they were fixing to send him to trial, and, and he may be fixing to lose his life. But instead, he pins these words in Philippians 4. If you will, let's honor God by standing for the reading of his word this morning. Philippians 4 and verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Look at your neighbor and say, he's near. Do not be anxious about anything. 
but in every situation. Somebody say every. Because see, this is the hardest one. It's easy to read it, but it's the hardest thing for us to do. In every situation, see, we might get by, you know, a little, little small something, something, but let a little trial come in. That's a situation. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Father, we come before you today, and we just ask that as we endeavor into your word today, that you anoint these words. And, Father, that the, the ears be anointed to hear your words today. Father, we're here to, to seek you. And I know there's some here and those that are watching right now that are going through some trials and some tests. And your word says, be anxious for nothing. Now we ask for that peace that transcends all understanding. And we thank you in advance in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Y'all may be seated in the presence of God this morning. Um, you know, we, we talk about this and, and we ask the question, who needs a peace of mind in here? I'm talking about that, that peace that transcends all understanding. Sometimes, uh, I don't know about you, but I've been going through some stuff before, and, and, and God's given me peace that I can't explain except but God. A amen? And I don't know why, but it, it, it just rose up. Most of the time, what happens is our mind goes to racing. Just me. We get a little overwhelmed. We get a little uncertain. We live in some uncertain times as we speak today. And then pressure. And then the enemy does what he does best. He sows fear. Come on. Today in this generation that we live in today, the biggest form of anxiety is decision anxiety. Making decisions. How many in here are, are, are good decision makers? Not always, right? But I think we've all made bad decisions, and, and, and can I tell you something? God always carries you through them, didn't he? He always carries you through them anyway. I don't know about you, but that's one of the things that I, I don't want, ever want to make bad decisions uh, that, that are irreversible. Come on. Have ever been to that place in, in your life that you just don't know what to decide? And that can become stressful. Come on. Because we know that. We know that sometimes we can make bad decisions. So we don't want to make the wrong decision, but yet we know we got to make a decision. And then we get indecisive. Most people say, you ask people, are you indecisive? They say, no, not, not really. <laughs> Come on, y'all. We are. We're living in a stressful time. I mean, th this generation that's coming up behind us, they have, ooh, y'all, they, they got more decisions to make than we did. I I'll show you. How many of you know that? If you turn on Netflix, you got unlimited Programs you can watch. You may not have this problem, but I do. I got to flick through all of them to see which one I want to watch. It takes me 30 minutes to find something to put on TV. I remember when we only had three channels. And I always wanted to watch two of the three at the same time. Having too many options will jack you up. And we live in a time now that there's too many options in everything that we do. Come on. Can I say this? It's just complicated. Right? We live in the age of what they call now anxiety. We do. We live in an age 
of anxiety. And us older people don't get it quite as well as the younger people. But we all live in an age of anxiety. Amen? Why is it so complicated? It's the question. Why? It's because we have too many choices. We have too many choices. I, I remember growing up, we only had three different uh, car makers. You either bought a Ford, you bought a Chevrolet, or you bought a Chrysler. Now, now, there's a different one coming out every day. Y'all with me? I believe that too many choices leads to a lot of our anxiety because making a decision is hard. Can I tell you something? There's a documentary out that, that children from the ages of 3 to 10 make over 3,000 decisions a day. Adults, y'all watch, make over 35,000 decisions a day and wonder why anxiety runs as strong as it does. Amen? And the others, they just can't decide. They're indecisive. <laughs> uh, so first thing, is, is, the reason things are so difficult is because there's too many choices. Number two, we're afraid of making a costly mistake. Now, we're going to talk scriptural. Now, we're going to talk biblical. We, we don't, none of us want to make a decision that's out of God's will. Right? Yet you're here today. You're not wanting to make a decision that is out of God's will. Amen? Then the world tells you to find the one that's for you. You know, you're trying to find that spouse for life, and the, and the world says, find the one that's for you. Then the church tells you to pursue your purpose. And then the Bible tells us to live God's will. Oh, boy. So what if I miss the one that's for me? What if I don't know my purpose? What happens if I get out of God's will? Come on. I mean, we get froze sometimes what to do. We're not sure what we should be doing, and everybody said. And we hesitate, and we, we freeze. We're like, no, I can't make it. And then what happens is we do what most of the world does. We don't make a decision at all. And not making a decision is a decision. Come on now. But it's complicated, Pastor. You don't understand. You don't understand. It's, com it's complicated. <laughs> Life is complicated. You don't know what I'm going through. You're right. You don't know what I'm going through either. But we all together are going through something. All are going through stuff. We all have to make decisions. Come on. You made a decision when you got up this morning. I'm going to Life Spring Church. I'm going to 320 Fussell Road. I'm going to give my God some praise. I don't care how many deer run out through the woods. I'm going to be in church. And the church said, our problem is we make it complicated. See, see. A lot of us probably wouldn't want to go back there, but I would. I'd like to go back and see Andy and Barney and, and Aunt B. And when things were simple, they got out on the front porch and they thought through. Well, Aunt B, throw some chicken on the table. Woo! Make one of them pecan pies, make Barney's mouth water. Y'all help me. <clears throat> I want to give you one simple thought today. One simple thought. Turn with me to Acts, the 15th chapter. I want to talk about a powerful story here where the church leaders were coming together to make some 
hard decisions. Some doctrinal decisions. They were coming together and they were they were they brought the elders together. Well, Acts 15, verse 22. Then it seemed good. I want y'all to help me. Everywhere it says it seemed good, say it with me. Then it to the apostles and to the elders with the whole church to, to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. It seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. I got out of that. Just do what seems right. If it feels right, do it. And isn't that what the church, the world says? If it feels good, do it. If it seems right, do it. Well, then I have to go to the Old Testament. Old Testament says in Proverbs 14, there's a way that seems right to a man, but it ends, but its end is the way to death. And somebody say amen. So, so it kind of contradicting itself, right? If you read it one way, it's contradicting. So I had you distracted, and that's all the enemy wants to do is distract you. I distracted you on purpose. You ready? Hmm. No, let's go. Keep going. I distracted you on purpose because how many know that it's not hard to get distracted in this world that we live in? How many is, watch, how many is sit there, and if you'll be honest with yourself, you sit there and watch, you're just going to watch one or two TikToks, and they saying, you know, four hours go by. Come on. It seemed good. Some of it wasn't worth watching. And most of you don't even remember what it was. Hopefully you don't. <laughs> Hallelujah. But if it seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. If you're around the wrong people, listening to the wrong voices, Living for the wrong values, what seems right will often be wrong. That's worth saying again, isn't it? If you're around the wrong people, listening to the wrong voices, living for the wrong values, what seems to be right will often be wrong. Well, Pastor, I just got in the wrong crowd. Just doing what seemed to be right. But I always end up in the wrong place. Hmm. Now I ask a question. How, how could Paul, James, Barnabas, and other church leaders comfortably make decisions about their doctrine when what feels good to a man, seems right to a man, is death? They, they came together and they, listen, they, they had a board meeting. And this meeting was going to determine the destiny of all of us in their doctrine. They're fixing to discuss an important situation. What can you eat? And for church folks, that's a big thing. What can we eat and what we can't eat? I found that scripture in there that says, everything's good for you, just bless it. Come on. But then they were going to discuss whether or not you had to be circumcised to be saved. That would ruin this world we live in today. You, 
already when you call an altar call now, I mean, the, uh, it's like the Holy Spirit dragging them one way and they're pulling the other way. Couldn't you imagine men saying, we're going to have an altar call, but you must be circumcised today. Your altars would be empty. Just saying. That would not be. I, just let that set in for a second. I mean, they're having a, a serious discussion on some real important topics. Eating and circumcision. That's what they're discussing. I told y'all I distracted y'all a while ago for a reason. Acts 15, verse 22. Now we're going to look at some different scriptures, parts of Scripture. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders, watch this, with the whole church. I said with the whole church. Mm -mm, not with some, the whole church. To choose men. It seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. Now, y'all with me? See, it seemed good distracted us. How many of you know that no man is an island unto himself? No man is an island unto Unto himself. This is fixing to hurt, but anyway. Uh, there's a big difference between the whole church and a man. And everybody said, see, when you're when you're surrounded in a group of faith-filled, devil kicking, mountain moving disciples of Jesus, those that are searching his word, seeking his heart, listening for his voice, your decisions will then be different. So now they all gather together, and I'm so glad they had that decision, that, that meeting. Now we can sacrifice a chicken on Sunday, and you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. And the church said, boy. And everybody said, key things here. They came in with the whole church in one accord, unified church. Now let's, let's, let's break that down, the church. Because this is important. I want you to get this down in your spirit today. This building, this location is not the church. We are the church. We make up the church. One of the most selfish things that any human being can say. Well, I got to change churches. They're not meeting my needs. Listen how selfish that, that is. When the church is here to meet the needs of others. When we are the church, we'll be meeting the needs of others. And the Bible says what you do for somebody else, God will make happen for you. See, we need each other. Y'all have no idea the days and months and years that I've came in this building week after week. And I needed you way more than you needed me. But we need each other. So when one comes down, comes in weak, we lift them up. We are a family. And listen, I have not yet to find a perfect family. So when you do, please don't join it because you're finna mess it up. Somebody say amen. Now. When we are in fellowship, when we're in agreement in one spirit, what seems to be right will be in the will of God. But if I'm making those decisions by myself, listen, I can't say about the women's ministry, but I can tell you about the men. 
we will pray for you at a drop of a hat. And, buddy, we see things happen. We're seeing things happen when we lift each other up. This what I do up here and what this praise team does up here. It's just that much of what the church is about. It's actually the smallest part. It's lifting each other up and helping meet the needs of somebody else. That's the church. And everybody said, our problem is, is uh, we make things complicated. Do we not? Come on, I, I, I need to hear some. They, that, y'all polish your halo if you want to. I make it complicated. I make it complicated for myself sometimes. I won't shut this mind off. I can't seem to find the switch that turns it off. I got way too many decisions to make. I got too many choices to make. And, boys, yeah, I make it complicated, anybody. Hey, yeah, yeah. You, you can go down too many avenues now, right? What we have learned over these last four weeks, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. And the church said, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. And I don't know about you, but I need sometimes, I need somebody to pray with me. Where the Bible says any two come together is touch and agree. Any two or three come in his presence, there he is in their midst. That's, there's power in prayer. Instead of wringing our hands, what are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what we're going to do. And then all of a sudden, anxiety settles, sets in. You know what anxiety is? Ouch. It's a signal that you need to pray. It's a signal that you need to pray. Not fuss about it. Not complain about it. Not murmur about it. Not go to the phone. Go to the throne. If it's big enough to worry about, it is big enough to pray about. We got to understand that we don't always have power and control over every situation. The only power we have is the power to surrender. And we surrender it to God. That's the only power we possess is the power to surrender it to God. And if he's before you, who could be against you? Come on. And last week we talked about rejoicing. Again, I say rejoicing. Last week, we talked about worship, how to praise him through the midst of a storm. Not because of what he's done or what you're wanting him to do, but because of who he is. Who he is. Somebody say who he is. Rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. But We talked about the perspective of praise last week. How? To praise him. So out of this is what I came from. With a posture of prayer and a perspective of praise, we will seek God and do what seems right. With a posture of prayer and the perspective of praise, I will seek God. I will seek his will. I will seek what seems to be right to him. And everybody said, see, when, 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 you, when you get in that posture of prayer, in that perspective of praise, it's like driving with a GPS. Come on. I don't know about you, but I have seen some annoying GPSs. So I'm saying that not to be funny. I'm saying that to understand this. There's going to be times when God seems like he's taking you around something. When he should be taking you through it. Have you ever had that? You you turn left here. There's two streets here. Which one do I turn on? But if you're in tune with the, the Holy Spirit. When you turn, it's the wrong street. It'll say rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. Oh, I missed the wrong street. Let me go back to this next street where I belong. Come on. Anybody anybody ever had to do that? I mean, have you ever just had to do that sometime? You know what? I got to go back where I started from because I messed up. 
I didn't listen to the GPS. Mm -mm, I know my own way. Come on, y'all. Come on, men. I ain't lost. Where are we at? I don't know, but I ain't lost. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> What's awesome about that is when you mess up, all you got to do is fess up. When you make a mistake or you miss out on what you're supposed to be doing, always understand this right here, Romans 8, 28. And we know who's we, us is. Christ followers, saved folk, those that know him as their Lord and Savior. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So in other words, if we make a wrong turn, God is still working. Even when we make the wrong decision, he's still working. When, when we don't listen to him anyway, when the voice is saying rerouting and we still keep going our own way, he is still working. He'll take your bad decision and bring it to the good. Come on. I don't know how he does it, but he seems like he always has a way of bringing good things out of wrong turns. How does he do it? You know, like you said to yourself, I shouldn't have never dated him. I shouldn't have never dated her. Come on. All he did was bring you to a place that you would appreciate a godly man. I, I shouldn't have never trusted them. I, I, I never should have never trusted them. I knew they was going to do this to me. I just knew they were going to do this to me. You can't trust people. Mm. He'll take that one thing right there to grow your ability to forgive. Come on. I've made many of wrong turns and called myself listening to God. I said and called myself listening to God. But God always seemed to put somebody in my path to realign my GPS. That my friend, is why the body of Christ should assemble himself. I think one of the greatest things we used to hear was, oh, I ain't going to church. A bunch of hypocrites down there. And my, my statement to that was, there's always room for one more. Come on. Now is, I don't have to go to church to believe in God. No, you're right, you don't. Absolutely. Even the devil believed in God. I'm not trying to be harsh. That's a fact. You don't. But the writer of Hebrews says in these end days, and we're living in it. I mean, even the lost tell you we're living in end days. You know it's scary when the young people say, ooh, boy, these days are short, man. They're going by fast because the Bible says so. He's going to have to speed up time because man would not be able to endure it. In our economy, why, why, are, we so, why are we so stressed out? It's biblical. The Bible says that in his end days that, that a loaf of bread would be a week's salary. We ain't far from it. I mean, he gave us all the instructions that, that we should watch for. That families would be in chaos. Mothers against daughters, daughters against mothers, sons against fathers, and fathers against sons. Why are we? Full of anxiety. He gave us all the signs for the end time that, that men would be lover of self more than the lover of God. Man, we live in a vain society today. Y'all with me? Uh oh, the preacher don't want to meddle it now. Get back on your notes, Pastor. Oh, it's the facts. We let anxiety rule our lives because of decisions we have to make. Can I tell you something? If God be for you, 
Who and what can be against you? I got to take the Apostle Paul's advice. He said to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. I don't know about you, but that's going to be a glorious day. Then guess what? All those decisions won't matter no more. As long as you know him. I got to throw that in there, right? Amen. Somebody say, don't complicate it. Don't complicate it. Uh, mm. One of the greatest attacks the enemy has on the body of Christ today, and I pray you'll listen to this today. I want to give you some of this gray-haired wisdom today. Is he wants to steal your confidence. If he can steal your confidence, you are defeated. Watch. I, I, I know mine has been tattered. It has. It's been tried. I remember a time when I first got saved, I'd walk up to the meanest, ugliest, didn't matter who they was, and tell them about Jesus. i never forget, I was in Alter State Prison preaching on a Sunday night, on a Saturday night. And we was almost having revival. We was, we was having three and 400 people show up unheard of for there. And we were having church. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the... Um, the little trustee come up to me and said, uh, Pastor Knight, is that guy right there? He's the head Wickham in this, this facility. Oh, he makes wicker furniture? You cast all the spells you want. I'd be forming, I'm covered in the blood. And I remember I was preaching and, and I just stopped in the middle of preaching and said, if you don't get saved, you're going to die. And buddy, I mean, I saw people go, look, there is no guards in there. You in there by yourself. And I've had people say, you go in there by yourself? No, actually, no. I go in there with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I got somebody in the front, somebody in the back, and on each side. But about a month later, when I went back in there, he came in with a cane. He sat on the front row chanting. Most people would have thought he was praying in tongues, but he was chanting. Right in the middle of preaching, I said, God told me to tell you, if you don't get saved, you're going to die. Next time I come, they rolled him in there in a wheelchair. And as I was preaching, I said, God told me to tell you, if you don't get saved, you're going to die. But watch, you don't understand prison rules. Courier backed this up for me. He was the head Wickham. He couldn't get saved because they'd kill him. That joke I told him that, <laughs> that, that night, that joke fell out of that wheelchair. Said, what do I got to do to be saved? He didn't care. They had to take him out of gin and pop and put him somewhere else and transfer him out because he got saved. But I didn't lose my confidence. See, if he can steal your confidence, watch. How many times have you had the opportunity to share the gospel and you let your confidence of not knowing enough scripture? Don't, I'm not good enough. I make mistakes and, and all these things that the enemy's stealing your confidence to tell somebody about Jesus. Can I tell you something? He takes imperfect, broken vessels and he fills it with his anointing to be used. So if he can steal your confidence, because we make it complicated. And everybody said. So in Philippians 4, I'm going to let y'all go. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I'm going to ask our praise team to come up. And I want us to get into a 
posture of prayer with a perspective of praise. And we will seek God to what is right. If you will, stand to your feet this morning. I, I don't know who God's speaking to today. I do know this. He wants us to seek him to make decisions. If you're here today and you say, I got a decision I got to make, and it's a, to me it's a tough one, that, which will raise your hand this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, Father, we thank you. We thank you that all we have to do is be bold and come to the throne of grace with our prayers and our supplications. Father, for every decision that seems right unto a man, Father, we're asking for godly advice, godly wisdom. And we are in a posture of prayer this morning. It's not about nobody else. It's about me and you today. And we ask that you give us peace that is sins all understanding. So if you will, raise your hands this morning. And let's